Traveller's Guide to the Forgotten Realms. 1. The High Road, Tribal Trail and Fandalin, Sword Coast North, 30 miles northeast of Leyland, around 65 miles south of Neverwinter. The High Road is one of the most heavily trafficked thoroughfares in all of Faerun. It runs almost 300 miles south from Luscan to the shining city of Waterdeep, from where we will take ship and start our journey proper. I left the bustle of Neverwinter a ten day ago, taking my merry time and looking for something constructive to do, sure in the knowledge that Lord Sandrier had already stopped laughing at the audacity of my suggestion of doing a grand chronicle of Faerun. This part of the world is busy, well travelled and, compared to many of the places we're going to visit on our journeys, possessed of an enormous population. The Sword Coast North is a region of coastal mountains and cliffs, ancient forests and smoke-wreathed ironworks. This far north the winters are intense and long, but a warm wind from across the trackless sea makes it much warmer than other regions this far from the equator, or so the candlekeepers say. In the northernmost reaches, the Sword Coast is an eternally frozen, wind-blasted waste rising into the endless ice, a high glacier that runs as far east and north as one can go. The ice is kept from crushing the Sword Coast by the spine of the world, a vast mountain range that we will visit someday. Here, between Neverwinter and Waterdeep, the Sword Coast is well watered and frequently humid, with many people complaining that it never stops raining in the spring and autumn and the lands are frequently heavily blanketed with snow in winter, but the summers are hot and extended by the warm winds from the sea. A quick aside for those not native to this part of the world on the calendar and tracking of time. Faerun, being just a small part of the northern hemisphere of Toril, divides its 365 days into 12 months. Hammer, Alturiac, Chess, Parsak, Myrtul, Kythorn, Flamerul, Elasis, Elaint, Marpinoth, Uktar, and Nightar. Each month is divided into three weeks or ten days of ten days long each. The days simply being called first, second, third, and so on. In addition to the months and ten days, there are five annual festivals scattered evenly throughout the year to mark the changing seasons. These are Midwinter, Green Grass, Midsummer, High Harvest Tide, and the Feast of the Moon. Every four years, there is an additional festival day called Shield Meet, the day after Midsummer, to account for how, according to the scholars at Candlekeep, the year is a bit longer than 365 days, and the calendar would get out of order without the extra day every four years or so. I make no claim of understanding how they know that, though. We will get to Candlekeep eventually, but it's a very long way south down the coast, next to the Cloud Peak Mountains. But back to my journey. I was making good time toward Waterdeep, planning to rest overnight in Leyland and hopefully making Waterdeep in another couple of days, as I climbed into the foothills of the Sword Mountains, with the Neverwinter Woods at my back and the mere of dead men and Leyland ahead along the coast. I came upon a group of adventurers taking a break from their travels. I joined them and exchanged the news of the day as people always do. The six, bruised and bloodstained, but happy as adventurers almost always are, told me of a village abandoned in an orc war centuries ago. It had been recently refounded in order to exploit the rich mining to be found in the region, following the chaos of the Second Sundering. It was close, just a single day's hard ride off the main road and called Fandalin. As I had more than a ten day before I was actually due in Waterdeep, I decided it was worth a detour. As a heavy rain settled in, I took shelter in a nearby tavern and resumed my travels at first light, tagging along with a band of shield dwarf miners returning to their hold. We left the high road and joined the Tribor Trail, a long road that is in reality little more than a track for the most part, connecting the coast with the village of Coneyberry and the crossroad trading post of Tribor, as well as countless villages and settlements in between. If one follows it beyond Tribor, one would come to Yartar and everything that lies beyond. I was grateful for my escort, as the Tribor is not the high road, neither in terms of paving or safety. Bandits, orcs and goblin bands are all too ready and able to relieve the incautious traveller of either his purse or head, or both. We parted company after a few hours, with me promised a bed and a feast should I visit them in the coming ten days. I'm starting to think that I might miss my scheduled arrival in Waterdeep. 
I turned off the tribal at a small signpost next to a pair of rutted wagon tracks cutting into the undergrowth. This land is old and full of secrets. Being north of the mountain, the days are a little shorter all year round with the sun disappearing early, behind the peaks. I rode until the edge of nightfall, certain I'd have to find a place to set up camp and cursing myself for not visiting the temple of Lady Luck before I left Neverwinter, when I spied a stream of smoke wafting up over a distant stand of windswept pines. I pressed on and came to the village just as the sun dipped behind the mountains and I said a prayer to Saluni for holding off long enough for me to get to safety. The village held only a few dozen lights illuminating the night, but the largest one, as always, was the inn. It wasn't a festival, the place was far too small for such a thing. The darkness was complete as I reached the inn and woke the sleeping stable boy, who was genuinely stunned to have a visitor. He tried to talk my ears off while I sorted my gear and was ushered into the inn. Up close, the inn is nice enough, spread across three floors and built solidly from local white stone and well-dressed timbers. It seemed, in the moonlight, to be the largest building in the village, but that was to be expected. Inside, I was greeted by a grinning human by the name of Toblin, the proprietor, which I scarcely believed due to his youth. The place is modest, with rushes on the stone floor, but full of light and cheer. A few of the locals eyed me suspiciously, as I was escorted to one of the inn's six rooms, with a straw bed, washstand and wardrobe, as well as a huge shuttered window, looking out over the town square. After throwing down my bags, I went down for my supper, which was, like everything else, simple but filling. I spent most of the evening talking with Toblin, and over the course of a few too many cups of surprisingly good dwarven beer, he told me all about the region and the history of Fandalin, before offering me a guided tour the following morning. Many hundreds of years ago, clans of dwarves and gnomes made an agreement known as the Fandelver's Pact, by which they would share a rich mine in a wondrous cavern known as Wave Echo Cave. In addition to its mineral wealth, the mine contained great magical power. Human spellcasters allied themselves with the dwarves and gnomes to channel and bind that energy into a great forge, called the Forge of Spells, where magic items could be created. Times were good then, and nearby Fandalin prospered as well. But then disaster struck when orcs swept through the north and laid waste to all in their path. A particularly powerful force of orcs, reinforced by evil mercenary wizards, attacked Wave Echo Cave to seize its riches and magic treasures. Human wizards fought alongside the dwarf and gnome allies to defend the Forge of Spells, and the ensuing battle destroyed much of that cavern. Few survived the cave-ins and tremors, and the location of the Wave Echo Cave was lost, while Fandalin's king Tresendar was killed, the town left in ruins and abandoned. For centuries, rumours of buried riches have attracted treasure seekers and opportunists to the area around Fandalin. In the last three or four years, hardy settlers from Neverwinter and Waterdeep have begun the hard work of reclaiming the ruins of Fandalin. A bustling frontier settlement has grown up on the site of the old town, and is now home to farmers, woodcutters, fur traders and prospectors drawn by stories of gold and platinum in the foothills of the Sword Mountain. Unfortunately, more than a few bandits and brigands have settled here as well taking advantage of the fact that the area has no local lord or authority to chase them off. A gang known as the Red Brands has controlled Fandalin for the past two months, exhorting and bullying everyone in town. The gang is led by a mysterious figure known to the townsfolk only as Glassstar. The next day dawned bright and cool, and I was roused early by the bustle of a surprisingly busy little town. The village is pretty, idyllic in a cool frontier fashion. It shows sign all round of greater days past, a fallen and mostly buried boundary wall that has been cannibalised to build a new generation of simple dwellings and workplaces. The few buildings that spread over more than a single floor are built with wood and thatch. Ruins are everywhere, moss covered and of the same handsome white stone as everything else. Toblin and I start at the Stonehill Inn, which I've already covered. He explains that when he first came to the region a few years ago prospecting, but discovered that he was better at serving drinks to miners than being one himself. Then he met his lovely wife Trelena and opened the tavern. They have a young son together, Pip. His family is the reason he takes no action against the Red Brands. Barthen's Provisions is the biggest trading post in Fandalin, run almost around the clock by Elmar Barthen, a slim, balding but vigorous middle-aged man who employs two local boys, Ander and Thistle, to help run his store. In addition to supplying the town, the post also sells gear to miners and adventurers passing through the town along the Tribal Trail, but they leave weapons and armour to the other major store in town. 
The Lion Shield Costa is the place to get arms and armour in Vandalin. A Costa is an alliance of small independent traders or merchants that band together into shared caravans for safety in travel and to increase their bargaining power by acting collectively. The Lion Shield is a bit of an oddity in Vandalin due to the formality of its operation and the sharpness of its proprietor. Linen Greywind is serious, efficient and handsome in a cold way, but she has come to love the tiny town that she now calls home and actively opposes the red brands as much as possible. The Fandalin Miners Exchange is where the town makes its money. Small holding miners from miles around come there to weigh in their finds in exchange for gold, which many spend in the two inns. The exchange also serves as a record store for the town and surrounding region, tracking who holds the rights to which claims, mines, water sources and the like. It's operated by the guildmaster Harlia Thornton, who is an ambitious, grasping human woman who clearly wants the town to dance to her tune. Halia is almost certainly after taking over the role of Fandalin Townmaster, being too large to go without any formal governance and too small to elevate someone to any kind of title or even elect a formal and full-time mayor. The residents of Fandalin elect an annual Townmaster to administrate the area. The Townmaster's Hall is a small building that serves as an official centre of the town an office for said townmaster, and a small but serviceable jail in the cellar. The current townmaster, for who knows how long, is another anomaly in the town. Fat in the extreme and with the pretensions of a yartarine banker, Harbin Wester is all flowing robes, too many rings and heavy makeup. He shows huge fear of the red brands, downplaying their threat to the town. I suspect he won't be around the place for much longer, and it will definitely smell better without his perfume. Moving on, there isn't a temple in the town, it is still too small and new for such a thing to have been established. But there is the newly built Shrine of Luck, dedicated to Timora, watched over by the town's only elf, Sister Gorel. Sister Gorel is alarmingly well versed in the comings and goings of not only Fandolin, but the wider sword coast at large for even the fortune of a priestess of Lady Luck. She appears particularly zealous for her goddess and clearly despises the red brands. The shrine itself is typical for something Timorian, a seemingly haphazard collection of local fallen stones that, in defiance of common sense, somehow form a perfect hemispherical dome over the little shrine. It is impressive, and rather stand out to say the least, in the middle of the town square. The sleeping giant is a rancid, filthy pit that could approximately be called a tavern. I decline Toblin's reluctant offer to venture inside to meet Grister, the owner and the town's only permanent dwarf resident. Apparently a major hangout of the Red Brands, it has a terrible, terrible reputation. And that covers the majority of the central town, with the remainder consisting mainly of rope makers, a blacksmith, farrier and other tradespeople. Moving outside the centre of the town, there are a series of farms, gradually becoming fewer and smaller the further one travels. Duran Eldermouth is a friendly half-elf of well over a century who tends a large orchard, growing some of the best apples I've ever tasted. I spent more than an hour with him in the evening drinking homemade cider and talking about his time as an agent for the Order of the Gauntlet on the Dragon Coast of the Sea of Fallen Stars. It is clear that he misses his work, but won't speak of why he retired so far away from where he spent most of his life. Duran clearly hates the Red Brands and groups like them, and while he's insistent on his retired status, he clearly loves his new home. The other major farm close to town belongs to Kellyn Alderleaf, and regularly plays host to a local druid called Radoff. Kaleen is a motherly, grey-streaked halfling, whose time seems to mostly be spent chasing her energetic ten-year-old son, Carp. Carp's greatest ambition in life is to become an adventurer. Kaleen is very knowledgeable about the comings and goings of her town, and is very much its resident Agniard and counsellor. The other and most curious feature of the town is the ancient and collapsing Tresendar Manor. More of a castle, really, than a manor. It is built in the style of centuries past and abandoned for at least several centuries. It seems a miracle that any of it has survived this long, but the manor and its history are compelling, well worth part of a separate report by itself, which I will present along with some of the more noteworthy areas and sites near to Fandolin. For now, Lord Sandre, I remain your humble servant, Valerian. P.S. My good lord, please remember to visit the trade house Etsy, and examine the wares of Bindwood Gaming. Tell her Law Lounge sent you for a 10% discount. She makes all manner of geeky accessories, including coasters, notebooks, flasks, 
and I'm reliably informed that dice are coming soon too. PPS. I've also taken to crafting character backstories and personal histories for hire. After a reasonable amount of peer pressure, I've signed up to Fiverr, where you can hire me to create your character, NPC, or even whole organisation and town. If you're stuck for ideas, the link is to be found below. Thank you very much for watching. Dungeons & Dragons has been a part of my life for the better part of two decades now, and I've recently been introduced to how popular it has become online. Now that in 5th edition The Forgotten Realms is the standard setting world for the game, I thought I'd use some of my excessive experience to try and bring some deeper immersion to others' games. The current version of Faerun is extremely sanitised and toned down from its origins, and a deep understanding of the world consequently harder to come by. I currently plan on covering the entirety of Faerun, however long that takes, but I'm starting out with the starter kits, Lost Mine of Fandelva and Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, and I have a question for listeners. Would you like Falrian to visit just the most important locations, or all of them that appear in these boxes? Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and all of that good stuff. This is a new endeavour for me, and not covering 40k seems to have cost me some subscribers. Not that I had many to begin with. Please check out my Fiverr if you're interested, but any support you can offer me or my channel would be hugely appreciated. You're all truly wonderful, hail to Chauntier the Great Mother, and I'll see you all soon. This is Thomas, from the Law Lounge.